Good morning. Welcome to today's briefing. Today, I want to talk about flight missile test 48 that occurred on October 25th, 2023. That's just a few days ago, time of this recording. And it occurred at Pacific Missile Range Facility just north of Hawaii, where they launched two subsonic anti-ship missiles onto the missile range. And then two more intermediate range ballistic missiles were also launched. On the range was one Arleigh Burke destroyer, DDG Carl M. Levin, DDG 120. The call to the weapon systems officer was to put the Aegis system in automatic defense mode or automatic engagement mode. This means that the Aegis system can determine the targets and put them in priority and then engage them in order of that priority. And it can engage over 100 targets simultaneously. But this test only uh, included four missiles. So there we have the weapon systems officer closing the firing circuit, which means now the Aegis system can automatically engage at will. Here we have two SM-3 uh, anti-ballistic missiles being, or missiles being launched to intercept them. And those are two, they'll eventually launch four SM-2 missiles. Now it's normal to shoot two uh, anti-cruise missiles or surface to air missiles at cruise missiles. So that's normal. And they destroy both incoming cruise missiles with that. Here you can see video from the ship to give you an idea of how close that is whenever they finally engage those. Um, and this is the engagement of the intermediate range ballistic missiles right there. You can see two good kills on that. So very successful test against four incoming missiles, two being intermediate ballistic missiles and two being subsonic, you know, low to the ground, low to the water cruise missiles. And uh, everything went very well for this test. So big congratulations to everyone that's working out there at the Pacific Missile Range Facility. This is a huge victory for you. And when I posted this video over the weekend by itself without any commentary from me, there was a lot of really good questions. So I wanted to address one thing. Uh, is the Aegis system uh, publicly can engage in excess of or more than 100 targets at the same time. And the way it does that is the Aegis system is like a network. So any fleet or air asset that's in the network can uh, be used as a shooter platform. And that's why, and we'll talk about more in this video later on, uh, about how unmanned vessels are assisting our fleet now by bringing more ammunition to our carrier strike groups. Yep. And so the Aegis can tell another platform to use its missile battery, uh, keeping its own missile battery for future use if it comes down to that. And so the unmanned vessel, for instance, could go back to port, get a new container of SM-6 or, S or rockets, you know, missiles, whatever, weapons, and bring it back to the fleet while the original you know, Arleigh Burke destroyer, like in this case, stays on the firing range or stays in theater, doesn't have to go reload. That's what the unmanned vessels are gonna be doing. So that's just another way that the Aegis is very capable is that it doesn't have to use its own munitions and can track and destroy over 100 targets, which is pretty incredible. It can also do it at much large, longer ranges than what we just saw there, but they're not gonna give away those ranges, right? All right, let's head over to Taiwan where China is poking its head out again, like Poxitani Phil looking for a shadow. Let's see, what do we have today, China? It is uh, the Chinese Type 002 aircraft carrier. This is the Shandong. This is their second of three aircraft carriers. They are building a fourth. Uh, eventually that thing's gonna get made, I guess. Uh, this is a Kuznetsov class uh, aircraft carrier. They, China just basically built a Kuznetsov class. It's a short takeoff and arrested recovery aircraft carrier, which means that the planes just drive off the nose and it has that ski ramp on the bow to help them get some lift as they take off. But whenever they land, they do have arrestor wires like the Americans have on our carriers to uh, hook and stop the plane whenever they land. Now the Shandong does give China credible blue water capability because it can carry 40 aircraft at 30 knots and it's at, at sea right now with a fleet oiler. So it can stay at sea in blue water for weeks. Uh, we'll see where she goes. We're gonna be tracking her. Last uh, time she was out back in, uh, March of this year, she went uh, just north of Guam and did some operations there. So we'll see if uh, she heads back to Guam. Right now she's not doing much of anything other than just being at sea. Let's head over to the South China Sea, just south of the Shandong, where a Chinese J-11 conducted an unsafe approach to within about 10 feet of a United States Air Force B-52 bomber that was flying over the South China Sea. They watched the uh, J-11 come in with this pod 
and this is the first time I've seen this pod uh, made public. Uh, even though it's redacted, as you can see here, the fact that they even released this footage, I think is very impressive. Uh, it shows that we probably already have something better, but this uh, pod here, this electrical optical pod is very, very capable. And uh, I'm not gonna say any more about it, but I would recommend that you check out the drive um, war zone because uh, Tyler over there has been trying to publish an article on this recently. And I suspect that with this footage, he'll probably do it. Very, very good, uh, very good piece of kit. All right, also in the South China Sea, below where that intercept is going on, we have the Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group participating in exercise Find Out in the South China Sea, implementing interoperability with our ghost fleet and with our Japanese and Australian allies. Now that exercise with the Australian allies and the Japanese ships is called Exercise Noble Caribou. It is not clear whether Ronald Reagan is actually part of that or not, but I do know that our unmanned surface vessels, our ghost fleet, are with the fleet now. And so, for those of you that don't know what the ghost fleet is, I'll go over it here quickly. It is a rapidly growing number of unmanned vessels that will accompany our fleet, and have been accompanying our fleet this year in deployment in the Pacific. Uh, they bring, these unmanned vessels bring a lot of capability. The first is, uh, an integrated sensor network, that Aegis network I was talking about, these are fully integrated into that, so they can put these ships uh, out away from the carrier strike group, almost like picket ships from the 1970s and 60s, uh, only this time they're unmanned, giving us greater fidelity of sensors at greater range. Also, and this is a good example for this one, this ship could be used as a minesweeper ahead of the fleet, seeing if there's any mines in the way coming up and then they would go forward and, and remove the mines if detected. This is also an ASW Hunter variant, so it could drop a VDS down, a variable depth sonar, and do a sonar search without having to throw a, or use a helicopter out there. So this is just a better, more efficient way of uh, conducting naval warfare while minimizing personnel you know, and, and, and assets. There is another version of this, um, of the Ghost Fleet, that carries the SM-6 rockets or missiles. And so like the missile test we just saw, the Carl M-11 could have used that Ghost ship to engage those cruise missiles or ballistic missiles instead of its own magazine like we talked about earlier. So the Ghost Fleet here is really adding a good capability to our Navy fleet and it's integrated now. This is something we've been working on when I say we, I mean the US Navy for well over 20 years now and it's finally happening. That's just how long it takes to get this stuff going it seems. Now let's head over to Israel's land reclamation project uh, where Israel Defense Force is reducing Palestine's carbon footprint in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they did this by cutting off all electricity and fossil fuels, good for them. Uh, Israel also cut off over the weekend now internet and mobile device communication all along the Gaza Strip. They, cut, they shut it all down. And the reason they did that is that limits Hamas's ability to coordinate a defense as the Israeli ground invasion begins. And we saw that happen over the weekend. And it's ongoing right now, time of this recording, is there are Israeli ground forces in the city of Gaza clearing it out. And they are finding an incredible um, amount of networks below the city. These are just some of the pictures. This is from Israel's um, website, and they posted a video that we're gonna watch as well, where they estimate almost 300 miles of reinforced tunnels are crisscrossing beneath the Gaza Strip. Uh, so let's take a look at this video here. This is just a part of the video. Um, you can see the concrete arched tunnels. They have rooms like this where they can conduct meetings and store weapons, and it's all beneath this city. It's a pretty incredible engineering achievement if you wanna look at it like that. You know, for several years, they're digging these tunnels by hand and manually moving around rockets. These are very motivated and creative people. I'm talking about the people that made these tunnels. And so there's something to take away from that that I think is positive. And so I'm gonna put on, you know, my, my positivity hat here, you know me, I always try to find a silver lining in a lot of things. And if you go on social media and news right now, anything about Gaza is very bleak, all right? So, but I'm gonna take a look at it from my perspective. This is how I see the future of the Gaza Strip under Palestinian leadership, all right? So this is a picture of Gaza Beach before October 7th of this year, before this all kicked off. Okay, it's a beautiful Mediterranean location. Gaza has about 20 miles of beach. That's prime real estate, that's a really good asset. There is another 
Mediterranean country that's only about two miles long. That's like one tenth of the beachfront that Gaza has, and it's called Monaco. This little nation has become an enclave for the wealthy by building hotels, casinos, and a beautiful waterfront. So when this conflict is over, there will be new leadership in Gaza. It won't be Hamas. It's going to be somebody else. And that leadership has a decision to make. Now, Gaza City has already become the greenest city on the planet. Uh, they have near zero carbon emissions, except for the occasional JDAN that comes down. And this gives Gaza access to millions of dollars of ESG investment money. And if you don't know what ESG investment is, that's fine. Just pick a leader for the Gaza Strip who does know what it is. Also, there's a lot of demo work already done for Gaza, thanks to the Israeli Air Force. So as Gaza rebuilds itself under its new, new leadership, you've already got a head start. And the new leadership will determine what direction will the country go? Is the future of Gaza one of wealth and comfort, a la Monaco, or not? So this is what Gaza Beach could look like. So don't sell yourself short. Any nation that can build hundreds of miles of tunnels that have power, uh, lighting, communication, and are reinforced, they don't collapse on their own often. The, the tunnels beneath the city of a million people is a great engineering achievement. They can turn that energy, that engineering creativity into this. You can rebuild Gaza into a beautiful tourist destination. This is a very real future for Gaza, but it's up to you to build it. Hey, Gene. Hi, uh, Gene, did you see that 47% of the people in the Gaza Strip are under the age of 18? Well, Half the population are children. How do they let that happen? Like, have these people not heard of abortion? I think a big part of the Gaza problem going forward is going to be daycare. 